Okay, I think we'll just make a wee start at that. Numbers continue to dribble in, but we'll just uh, make a start in the interest of everyone's time. Um, so welcome to this, our final part of our Sustainable Beef Systems series uh, through the Farm Advisory Service. Uh, today we're focusing on fertility, which obviously is a, we're at the other end of fertility on a lot of businesses looking at the start of calving. But obviously when we're, when we're thinking about fertility, it's the one point in the year, it's the the or the, the thing that drives or the biggest driver to profitability in any any beef or sheep system. So um hugely important topic and certainly um one that we've got some very able panelists to discuss with a uh, with tonight. So important to keep in mind a uh, usual story, but this is your it's your webinar. So please do ask questions, whether that's through the, the chat or the uh, QA function. Uh, or last time I was getting a few texts and things directly to me, which is all all appreciated, all fine. Uh, but do ask the questions you're you're thinking, because there's nothing surer that if you're thinking it, someone else is thinking it too. So uh, let's have as many questions as we can, and we'll hopefully have a good a good question and answer session at the end uh, after we've had a few presentations. Um, so tonight's panel um, three, and actually quite a nice diverse panel. Um, we have. A vet in Mark Pearson, who's who works with a uh, Murray Coast Vet Group. Uh, so Mark obviously is going to do the more specialist end of things. Uh, Bruce Wiper is our really pleased to see Bruce here today. Um, he's our senior stockman at SRUC Easter Howgate. Um, so certainly has a lot of experience of making a lot of progress actually in a in a beef system and, and beef fertility. So what a good stuff to come from there. And then we've got Karen Stewart, who is a our or one of our uh, ruminant nutritionists and saying it's really good for me to have Karen here as well for a bit of a, a safety blanket that I know we can fill a lot of gaps there as well uh, when it comes to questioning and things down the line. So um, probably without any further ado, I will just ask Bruce for you to come forward and share your screen and uh, do your presentation. Hi there, let me just get this going now. Uh, as Robert said, I'm the senior stock person here at SRUC Easter Howgate. And I'm just going to do a quick presentation on our breeding systems and our fertility programs here. So a quick overview of our farm. We're 300 spring sucklers that we're calving in the spring herd office. We've got 50 and 70 autumn cows in the back end uh, that we calve from about August onwards. We're a hill, upland and a lowland farm. Uh, we range from 150 metres up to 500 metres. We've got just over 1,000 hectares in to total of farmable land. 650 hectares of it is a hill, 150 hectares is upland and 200 hectares is better lowland grass. Our main objective here at Easter Howgate is supply and research with uh, cattle that they require for their projects. Uh, but also we have a big commercial side as well uh, to get them away. We've also, we're an education unit for students that are studying at SRUC Edinburgh at King's Buildings. Uh, here we use artificial and AI and uh, natural bulls in the spring herd and then the autumn herd is AI only. The breeds that we're running here at Howgate is we've got an Angus cross limousine, a limousine cross Angus and a pure ling herd. The Angus Cross Limousine and Limousine Cross Angus bloodlines have been here at Howgate now for quite a long time, at least 20 plus years, uh, which is quite vital for the research side. It means that they know everything about that certain bloodlines that are coming through for their projects. All our progeny are finished on the farm. Uh, again, this is one of the big driving things behind the research. They need to know all the data that we get back from anything that we send away to get killed so we don't sell anything store or any calves weaned. We keep our own breeding heifers here so we're trying to be as much a closed herd as we can. The only thing we're buying in nowadays is breeding bulls. A couple of years ago when the ling herd started getting established here we obviously had to bring in some pure lings to start that herd but for the last five years now we haven't brought in any. Our heifers, we're aiming to calve them down at two-year-old, and then we'll discuss a bit more about that in the next couple of slides. So our breeding programmes that we've got here at Howgate, this is this is purely for the spring calving. Uh, we use a triple synchronised AI programme that is over 58 days, and it gives us a 47-day calving pattern. Uh, the reason we quite like the 
AI here is it keeps our heifers tight and that may gives them optimum recovery time the following year when they actually do go to a bull. Uh, sorry. The cost that we're working on per calf conceived in the AI for 2023 was £100. So this was the total AI cost and the total carrying cost per calf that was conceived come scanning time. Uh, on a natural service side, we're using bulls. They go out for nine weeks, which is just over three full cycles, which is 63 days. So already you can see that using bulls, even on a three three cycle, is longer than the triple AI program that we use. For us here, we only put one bull to one batch the whole time. We don't change them around, which is a little bit different from what a lot of people will do. Uh, the reason we do that is, again, on the research side, they need to know categorically who the sire is. If, for any reason, a bull hurts himself and we have to put another bull in with that batch, or say we have to put them towards the AI program, we would have to DNA sample all those calves uh, just in case they go on a uh, home office trial later on in their life. If you're using a bull, the main thing that we do is, compared to the AI, is you just have to really monitor your cows for which ones are returning. So when the bulls first go out, just we keep a wee note of what cows are actually being served and then check them again in 21 days. And hopefully you just want to make sure that nothing's coming back too many times or too many all at once, uh, which will indicate that there's something wrong with your bulls. We do scan all the cows on the same day uh, in the middle of July, again, which is slightly different for most people. We'll look at that in the next slide. Uh, the reason we do this is at the end of July, we've got to scan the cows that are in the AI programme. Uh, to determine what is in calf in the first cycle so we know not to put them into the third round of the AI. We decided a couple of years ago that we were going to do all the cows uh, on this day purely because it gives us peace of mind to make sure that the bulls are working. It will allow us to find out what's went in calf to him in the first two weeks that the cows went out, that the bulls went out, sorry. That way we will also know that those cows are going to be our very earliest calving uh, but also to make sure that the lists of any cows returning, we can make sure have these not been in calf, are they held? And it's just more a peace of mind for us to know what's happening. And then right at the bottom there, it will just say that for 2023, we worked out using all our bulls that it was £55.30 and pence per calf conceived. So you can see using natural service with bulls is quite a, wee bit, quite a bit cheaper uh, in, the, in the terms of costs. The next one. Uh, this slide, we'll just look at this slide very quickly for you that have never looked at or worked with an AI program before. So this is our AI program that we follow during the summer. On the left here is the date column, and that will show you the dates we're putting things in. So the only thing we, have, we changed and we do slightly different from some people is two years ago, we decided to put cedars in our heifers on the 17th of May. We left them in for a full two weeks before pulling the cedars out on the 31st of May. The cedars then are disposed. What we found is this is allowing the heifers to come in, be synchronised, and then when we pull the cedar out, it gives them a heat. They all come in, they all should hopefully come bulling, and then we just let that die off. Because what we found is the first-time heifers... Uh, the first heat that they get from an AI program, we weren't getting good results from it. They weren't bulling as well as what we'd hoped for. And then we always noticed that our, sec our old second AI dates, we held a lot more. Our conception rates were a lot higher. So we decided we'll bring that forward. So now what is our original first heat? We just let the heifers have that and it dies off. We don't do it. And then naturally, because they're already synchronized by the first seeder in May, they will naturally come back a bull in 21 days later, which is when we AI on the 19th of June that you can see there. Uh, but this is just a quick rundown of the program that we do. And obviously on the 24th of July, you can see three quarters of the way down the page, that is the day that we scan. So that is the same day, obviously, that we're scanning all our cows, not just the AI cows that we're doing there. So why do we AI here at Easter Howgate? For us, we can use three or four different bulls for a group of for a small group of 30 cows, if not less, if we want. For us, that's quite important because in terms of research here, the, they're needing a wide, diverse range of bloodlines. So they might require five different bulls to be used over a very small batch of cows. So they've got five or six of each bloodline. Uh, in the book when they come to do trials, mainly on the bullocks that we do here, we don't really do trials that often on our females. 
it gives us a greater variety every year so we can change our bulls year to year. So if a certain bull doesn't really work with our cows or we don't like his calves or just it just they just didn't work together, we can easily just say, okay, we're not going to use him next year. We do tend to try and use a bull for at least three years. Uh, that way it gives a good dose of his blood coming into the herd in terms of us for our females that we're keeping. Again, it, we can change that. <clears throat> Sorry. We can change that if we find out that we don't like them, they, they haven't grown as well, or they just haven't worked with our cows. It gives us access to bulls that financially, on a commercial basis, we wouldn't be able to afford. Uh, so it's given us access to bulls that are way above what you'd pay on a commercial basis. We can select, obviously, what bulls we want. So for our heifers, we select extremely easy calving bulls. Uh, this is obvious. We calving down at two year old we don't want big calves coming out of these heifers uh, so if we can select some really easy calving trait short gestation periods it's going to give these heifers the best chance to get calved down naturally on their own <clears throat> our angus cross heifers uh, last year we made a change in these we decided to put uh, put them to female sexed limousine semen the only reason we decided to do this is it'll give us a bit more of a bigger pool of some females coming through, if we wish to choose from them. But also, when we analysed the data over the last four or five years, we noticed it a lot. We don't have many calving difficulties here, but the ones that we were having were mostly coming from this group. We were getting big limousine bull calves coming out of them. Uh, our heifers here were good size. It's not as if they were too small. Uh, so the decision was taken. It's on a monetary wise, it wasn't too much more just to put them to some female sex semen. We're hoping coming this calf, this calf and coming in the next month when we start, that we'll find these heifers are going to be able to calve down a lot easier on themselves. It's a lot less hard work and stress on them. We're not having to maybe put the calving jack on as many, and that way they can get outside and hopefully back and calve a lot easier without any problems. The other thing we're aiming for in our AI program at the moment is we're looking for bulls that are really up there within the 1% of our maternal traits across the board. The reason for that is obviously we, we keep in all our replacements. So we're relying on the AI to bring in some really good, strong maternal traits that will start filtering down our blood bloodline for when these cows are going to our bulls in natural service later on. Uh, we aim to use more growthy type bulls on some of our older cows because uh, it's not just our heifers that we're AIing. We're AIing uh, up to 50 cows, if not more, each year. Uh, so these older, bigger cows, they're proven that they can calve, not a problem. They're big, framey animals. So like, we'll have a, quite a look and we'll be able to select a certain type of bull that's just going to give us a bigger carcass and maybe put a bit more size into some of our cattle, a bit more muscle of all for our bullocks or else even a bigger frame for our cows that are coming through. The pure lings, in terms with AI, it makes them quite a bit more easier to manage because obviously keeping them as a pure herd, we're not then having to worry as much about our own bulls because when that heifer is her first breeding season, she'll never go to one of our bulls. It will always be an AI. So that way it's given us at least three years before any of these heifers are able to come back and go to their father. So it just gives us that extra year that we're not having to worry about them going to their in breeding. <coughs> Sorry. The other option is uh, for our heifers, it's ease of management. We're running all three breeds of these heifers just together in big groups out behind the farm. So we're not having to split them. We're not having to segregate the lings, the Anguses, and limousines, keep them separate, keep a bull from jumping the fence so that we can just run them all together in one big group or two groups, depending on the fields. And it makes it just a lot easier for management wise. Another option, the other thing for us, we've got a lot of hills and a lot of our upland ground here is on the Pentlands. Uh, it's got a lot of walkers, a lot of pathways, a lot of right of ways. So for us, putting AI cows up into these areas, it means we don't have to run a bull with them. So for health and safety with the public and just a lot less trouble with the public, it means we don't have to run a bull in these areas. Uh, so we can put certain specific groups into specific parts of the farm. Uh, or the other thing is as well, hilly ground. You don't, We don't want to be running a bull on a lot of ground that's really steep that he can hurt himself, he can fall, anything like that. So the fact we can just put the AI cows up there, we handle them, there's not a bull with them, makes it a lot easier. And then the last point on that is we have no bulls to keep. 
over the over the winter. We don't need to feed them. We don't need to house them. We don't need to handle them. Uh, they just aren't here with the AI. So I'll move on to the next section, which is our use of bulls here at How Easter Howgate. So we're currently running nine bulls. And a four. Uh, the reason that we've started to reintroduce a lot of bulls and doing uh, going a lot more natural service because we were all AI till about five years ago. Uh, was purely it's a lot less labour intensive. So obviously you can get a group of between twenty and twenty cows and forty cows. We can put them out in the field. You check them once, maybe twice a day, and you leave them. We don't have to be handling them as many times as what you saw in the AI program earlier on. Uh, there are a lot less stress on them. We're not having to run the calves in with the mothers and having to separate them, things like that. So it is a lot less labour intensive. It's also just a lot less handling of them. For us, because we're working with both the AI and natural service, we rely a lot more on the AI to bring in the maternal traits, which that means we can rely on buying a lot more beefy, muscly bulls. Uh, we're not using them for heifers. We're not having to worry about getting really easy calving bulls for heifers. So we can focus a lot more on muscly bulls to get bigger, framey uh, calves out of these girls. Uh, so it just it makes it makes bull selection a lot easier. We're not having to be as on as pernickety as some people have to be, depending on when you're using them. Overall, natural service with the bulls it gives us a better conception rate uh, than what we do for our AI, uh, especially in the later calving cows. There was always a late calving group in the AI that would never ever be able to go to the first cycle. Uh, these never particularly had great conception rates, so since we've got rid of that group and now they all go to the bulls, a bull will naturally get these a lot quicker than what we ever would do within the AI program. And it also means, sorry, it also means that all heifers going into their second breeding season go to a bull, so we don't put any calved heifers into the AI program. We just find it reduces stress on them, it lets them go to some of our best grazing fields. They can be left alone, let them grow whilst they're rearing their own calf, and hopefully they'll get back in calf with a bull. It's cheaper per head uh, of calf conceived, as we've seen earlier on. Last year we were £55 on average compared to £100. So that that's going on our figures of bulls, what we've paid for our bulls, working on an average that they're going to be here for at least five breeding seasons, so the bull will be seven-year-old. The average is coming up next. The average age of bulls working life is between five and six year old. Uh, so obviously, if you lose a bull due to injury or whatever reason, younger, that cost per calf conceived will go up uh, over his working lifetime. And if he if he lives to a seven or eight year old, that cost could come down. Uh, also, if you're having to get rid of a bull after five or six years you've got a replacement cost as well, which is a big outlay that you don't have all in one go on the AI. The other thing with the bulls is that you don't have with the AI, there's a safety risk with them. You've always got to be aware where your bulls are, always keeping an eye on them, especially when they're out there working with your cows in the fields. So a little bit about our selection process for our heifers here at Easter Howgate. So we implemented most of these we've implemented quite religiously for the last four or five years now. So every heifer has got to be at least 14 months of age on the first date of the AI. So that is the day that the first straw of semen is going to go into that heifer. We want her to be 14 months of age on that date. We're not, we looking back at some of our figures, it proved even a week, if not two weeks out, and that actually has quite a big effect on our chances to actually get in calf, but also the, getting her back in calf next year. Uh, so we keep we hold that quite well. We're working on a 60% mature body weight of our cows, uh, which for us is 420 kilograms. Uh, again, this we're pretty strict on nowadays. A couple of years ago when we first started putting this criteria, we did have a lot of heifers that weren't making this. Uh, so we were having to let quite a few through just to keep our numbers up because at the same time we were also growing our herd as well as putting these procedures in place. Whereas now, last year and on predicted weights of the heifers so far this year, we're going to hit every, everyone will be hitting this target of 420 kilos minimum that has been selected uh, for the first AI. Something else that we introduced a couple of years ago was pelvic scoring. Uh, we 
we've noticed and found out in the four years we've been doing it, we're losing about 10% of the heifers that have been drawn out uh, already. And these these heifers are ones that have been passed for size, age, temperament, feet, body condition, length. So to look at, they looked perfectly normal, perfectly healthy, and they were all thriving. Uh, one of the most common reasons that they're failing the pelvic scoring is just abnormal pelvis. It's either just not the right shape, it's too small or that. And our uh, AI technician who also does our pelvic scoring, he can check them quite quickly and he gives them a score from a one to a five, a one to a four, sorry. Uh, the other thing we did notice as well that we've picked up and we always are picking up maybe one, if not two each year, is a free martin in our heifers. And these are heifers, calves that have been born a single. So they, at one point in their life, where it must have been a twin inside the cow. Uh, so these are ones that's, that we're never going to be able to breed from. So if we put them into the AI program, that was just going to be throwing money down the drain and they were never going to have a chance of getting them in. We've noticed since we've started pelvic scoring our heifers, we've went from about eight to 10 C-sections a year down to about one or two within the heifer batch. So for us, it's... um. It's a perfect example of something that's very quick and easy to do that just helps you in the future. The other thing is for us is temperament. That's massive here at Easter Howgate. We've got a lot of visitors on site. We have a lot of students. We've got a lot of inexperienced people handling our cattle and going around the pens. So anything that just does not have the right temperament, we just do not keep. It's something I think a lot of people should maybe focus on a lot more uh, because it, the average, our ages aren't getting younger and things like that. The average age of people in this industry, so it's getting rid of animals that are just showing any signs of aggression at all. They're just not worth it. Other thing we're looking for is a good size length of frame. We don't really want a short, fat, dumpy heifer. We want her to have a good length about her, a good, good size frame on her, so she's got a lot of growing and potentially doing that for when she's got her carrying her calf. Uh, coming down the list is for feet. Uh, we've been culling quite hard the last couple of years on feet and we've also now started to make sure that the mother's feet are correct so even if the heifer's feet are looking okay if the mother is on the list for being culled or she's had a mark against her for her feet not being correct or if she's had to have her feet trimmed down or anything like that uh, she, will not be get, get, she will not be available to get kept in the herd uh, they've not to be from the bottom 10% of our weaning weight from our herd so we'll look at this later on a little bit <clears throat> But if that calf for her specific breed falls within the bottom 10% lightest weaned calves for that year, she will not be available, will not keep her for the spring herd. We can keep a lot of these ones that are going maybe in our autumn herd, uh, but that's just, we can talk about that. They're not to be out of any Yoni's positive cows uh, or bloodlines. Uh, so anything that tests positive, the her whole bloodline will be killed and that calf will not be kept for going into the breeding herd. And then just as a final note on that, if the mother is a cull for whatever reason, so whether or not it's she's got a bad udder, she's just got bad feet, she's not thriving, she's not weaning well, anything like that, we won't be retaining any of her heifer calves. They will go into the fat pen. And following on from that, we'll have a quick look at our culling policy. <clears throat> So in the last, what we've implemented is we will be culling all cows that are weaning calves within the bottom ten percent of our weights for two years or less. Uh, if they've done less than one kilogram per daily live weight gain per day, uh, we've got a couple of graphs to look at, and then that that just basically means what size of calf is she weaning. Like normally, we'll find the bottom ten percent cows are falling below that one kilogram per day anyway nowadays. <clears throat> If she's weaned a calf that's less than 30% of her body weight, so that's looking at a lot of your big, heavy cows that you think are sometimes our best cows here, and actually when we're focused on it, it's showing that they're not our best cows. We've got some big 900-kilo cows weaning a 220-kilo calf when you've got a 650-kilo cow that's working really phenomenally weaning a 310-kilo calf. Uh, so it's been able to help us do that. It's letting us get out a lot of just... The hidden, the hidden poor breeders, normally they're cows that you'd look at and you think they're doing really well. They're big, framey cows. And in reality, they're actually not returning us anything as near as good as what some of the other cows are. <clears throat> anything that's had any mastitis, 
if they've got bad feet that we've spoken about already, if they've had to have any treatment for any bad feet for two more times or in a year, we'll just be getting rid of them regardless of what the reason was. If they're 10, year old, 10 years or over, at the moment, we've not been able to stick to that too much because we're still trying to grow our herd. Uh, so we're currently sitting at 11 years and over, but we're hoping this year, maybe not, maybe next year, we'll be able to hit that target of culling things that are 10 years and over. Anything that's had a C-section, temperament that we've spoken about, damaged other. If they've been seen suckling other cows at calving time and things like that, and if they're a Yoni's positive cow. Quickly just talk about these four points here. So this is just a bit more of our management of the herd. So all heifers are calved down. They all get kept in the same group. We don't mix them once they go outside of their calf with older cows. Uh, they go into some of our best fields and then they get a, a bull goes to them. That way it's easier to manage them, keep an eye on them, make sure that they're still thriving and growing. And also if the weather changes, we can feed them additionally, which will do. Our AI groups, we keep away from areas of the farm where bulls are used for obvious reasons. When you're synchronising a group of 50 cows that are all bulling all at once, we don't want in our bulls deciding that it's time to jump the fence. Uh, in the AI group for the cows, we only put our first cycle calving cows. So these are all the earliest calving cows uh, of the year. We put them into our AI programme purely just because it is a more expensive way to get them in calves. So we want to give them the best possible chance of holding. So ideally, the first cycle ones should hopefully be the ones. And then we have an even split of bull groups between the first, second and third cycle calving cows. So we don't put all our first, we don't put lots of first calving cows in one group and then all third calving cows in another group for a bull. Because all that would mean is a bull that's got all the first cycle ones, they'll probably miss quite a few because they'll all be coming a bull in really quickly, too quickly for them. Whereas a bull with a third cycle, he'll not be doing anything until later on in the season. Then he might miss a couple of cows and then they won't have another chance. They might only have one cycle before the bull comes out. So by making an even group, hopefully it means that each bull's constantly working every day and it's not a mad rush all at once. Quickly just have a look at some of our tables here and some of our data at Easter Howgate. So some of our conception rates. So on the left, you'll see our table is for our AI conception rates. So in 2021, we were at 73%. This is for our heifers and for our cows. We have focused on trying to improve our AI over the last four or five years. And as you see, we've managed to pull up by 10%. So sitting almost at 84% for three rounds of synchronized AI with including sex semen in that for one group as well. Uh, we're really happy with that nowadays. Uh, on the right, you'll see our bull conception rates have stayed around about 90%. We're pretty happy with that as well because a lot of the best cows are going to the AI, so it does mean that a lot of the bulls are getting a lot of old cows, a lot of third cycle calving cows and things like back-end calvers. Uh, so, yeah, we're pretty happy with 90% and hoping now that we've pulled the AI up to a good percentage level that it might mean we can start putting some better cows back to the bulls and that will hopefully bring their AI result, their conception rates up as well. Uh, in the last couple of years as well, I should put, that we've been using, because obviously we weren't using bulls for quite a while, we've had a lot of young bulls being used. Uh, so again, that's why we're quite happy, the 90%. All our empty heifers and cows fall back into our autumn herd programme. Uh, which is fully AI'd, and we use male sex semen in that. We just get bull calves out of them. So nothing, no bloodlines come back from Norton Herd. So once they fall into Norton Herd, we're not too worried about retaining breeding stock from poorer bloodlines and anything like that because they, they never come back from Norton Herd in their spring herd. Have a quick look at our 200-day weaning weights. Uh, Do you think to watch the time, Bruce, if that's okay? Oh. Yep, I've got one more slide and then I'll, cool. that'll be me done. I'll get through these really quickly. Uh, again, this is our weaning weights over the last three years. So we'll just look at the bottom figure at the moment. So in 2021, our average weaning weight of 200 days was 255 kilos. We've got that up to 286. So by following everything I've spoken about and implement changes that we've been putting in place purely on our fertility and breeding-wise, we've managed to increase our weaning weight by 30 kilos over 33 years, which on a financial uh, point of view is actually quite significant. Uh, we'll just move on to that. Uh, this is what I spoke about earlier on very quickly. This was just our targets for our daily live weight gains. 
So where aim was three years ago in 2021 was to have under 10% of our cows weaning a calf that had done less than one kilo a day. At that point, we were at 30%. So over the last three years, we've managed to drop that to 7.59%. So we've achieved our target there. Again, that's reflected in the weaning weights uh, because you wouldn't achieve those weaning weights if too many of your cows weren't being able to achieve that one kilo a day. <clears throat> I'll just move on to the next one. Sorry, Robert. And a quick look at our bull maintenance and fertility that we do with the bull series to Howgate. We have them all housed in big open sawdust pens. They've got clean concrete standing areas at the front for feeding, which is good for their feet and just keeps them clean. All our bulls get foot trimmed in February, just to give them a quick check and a quick going over. It also means if anything is found that isn't obvious, they've got plenty of time to recover. They all get semen tested in April, uh, which again has given them enough time if any of them have any issues or if they fail, it gives them time to get get retested before we need them in June. We look to put them outside to grass at least six to eight weeks before they're due to work, just to let them get out, have a run about, stretch those muscles. And then the young bulls, they get fed four weeks, about four weeks before bulling, and then they get fed during the bulling period as well, just to make sure that they've got enough energy and they're meeting their required energy demands. That is me, Robert. Good man. Thank you very much, Bruce. A first time webinar presenter. I think I'll be uh, outstanding. I'm sure you'll get asked to do many more. <laughs> um, moving on, you finished really neatly there on a bull management. So we've, we're lucky we've got Mark Pearson here today, who Mark's done a bit of faz work already for us, which We'll see, I think, just directly. Um, but really just a, a deeper dive into bull fertility, obviously being half the herd and so important for meeting the targets we've got in front of us. So over to you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And thanks, Bruce. Um, really good introduction and a very impressive sounding herd. I think I'd like to speak to you and try and get a visit down there and see what you're doing. Um, one thing that struck me from what Bruce was saying there was that he's getting 90% in calf rate from his bulls. Um, we all hear a lot that uh, we should be getting 95%. I think it can be a little bit depressing for me sometimes at PD sessions when I'm finding that herds are getting 90%. We're expecting to do better. I would commend to any of you listening that 90% is a good real-world facility figure. Um, 95% is really hard to achieve. Um, to get anywhere near that level of performance, then we need to look at every aspect of what's contributing for to fertility. And bulls are obviously a really big part of that. So. I've been asked to speak to you about um, bull fertility testing. I'm going to cover some of the advantages, the reasons why you should do it, and um, hopefully dispel some of the ideas why you think you shouldn't do it, um, and then just go through a quick run-through of how the process actually works for those of you who have not seen it before. So I've been a farm vet for 25 years. Um, I've been bull fertility testing for about 18 of those years. And currently, I've not added it up, but I'm guessing I probably fertility test about 150 bulls a year. Um, and across all of the vets doing bull fertility work, um, regardless of the circumstances, uh, the current rate of bulls that are failing the fertility test is about one in five. So if you have a decent sized herd and you have a reasonable number of bulls in your herd, um, there's a statistical chance that one in five of them would be subfertile. We don't talk about infertility very much. Genuine infertility is quite rare in bulls. Um, but we expect bulls to be to certain standard um, according to the fertility test that we do. Um, and if they fall short of that, even though they might be able to get some cows in calf, they probably won't be hitting the conception rates that you need to get a good in calf rate over a tight pulling period. Um, so yeah, I thought about telling you why you should fertility test your bulls, but I'm guessing that because you're attending this webinar, you're kind of progressive people interested in being efficient. So there's probably lots of reasons that you could appreciate why it would be beneficial. So I won't spend too much time on it. Um, Getting a shorter breeding period means that your bulls have to be performing well. People are increasingly not bulling for 12 weeks anymore, looking at nine weeks and maybe even only six weeks with their heifers. And to achieve good pregnancy rates over that shorter period of time, you need to know that your bulls are going to be on it. Um, if you get a shorter bulling period, then you get a shorter calving period. That has all those knock-on benefits that you've told about, been told about before with improved weights at weaning, tighter um, grouping of calf weights, um, reduced days to killing, um, and a better quality of life, your life. I can't understand. I feel sorry for people who are kind of carving all year round. It must be exhausting. It's hard enough for me getting through a carving period at work, never mind actually doing it for a living. So making that as short as possible makes it easier on you, better for herd health as well, I think. Um, if your bulls are tested and you know that they're going to perform well for you, you can get away with a higher 
cow to bull ratio, more cows per bull. And bulls that pass the fertility test that we do, um, one bull should be fit to serve 45 cows and achieve a 95% in calf rate. Like I say, real world, maybe not going to manage that. Um, but that's the kind of ratio you could be looking at for a good bull. If your bulls are tested and you know that you have confidence in them, then there shouldn't be a need to swap them um, during the breeding period. I know some farms like to do that, prefer to do that, um, but it's not necessary if you've got faith in your bulls. Um, and then the final point, I think, for testing is just having the confidence. I test a reasonable number of bulls just post-purchase. I think if you buy a bull, um, if he has a warranty pre-sale, that's fantastic. I wish we were doing more of that. Um, but if you buy a bull and he doesn't have warranty and you work him and you find out uh, PDing that you've got a poor in-calf rate, the bull's already probably been on your premises for six months by then. And trying to demonstrate that he had any fault pre-purchase is really It'd be easy for the vendor to say it's probably something that's happened to him since you bought him. Um, becomes a mess of responsibility and blame. It's an issue of biosecurity trying to send a bull back. So I'd strongly encourage people who are buying good value bulls that don't come with a fertility test certificate to get them tested shortly after arrival during their isolation period. And then if there are any issues, you can hope to get it sorted out with a vendor with a bit more advantage on your side. Um, I wanted to shoot through some reasons why people don't do it. I, I don't spend too much time trying to persuade people to test bulls, but I do understand why some people feel they shouldn't. And one of the things I hear is that um, you only get a snapshot on the day. And it's true, the, the results of fertility tests are true for that bull on that day. Um, but I still feel that a snapshot on the day is better than nothing at all. And knowledge is power and knowing that your bulls are working um, should give you some confidence. It is only a part of your bull care. Um, even after fertility testing, you still have to look after your bull's feet. You still have to know that his disease status is good, make sure his vaccinations match your herds, um, make sure that his nutrition is good. Obviously, Karen will be covering nutrition later, but nutrition for bulls is really important, making sure that they maintain a fit um, working body condition and watching him and being ready to swap him if anything, any of those things go wrong. And if you are ready for that, then you also need to have a spare bull um, and that bull should be fertility tested as well. Keeping an old crockley bull as a spare isn't going to do you any favours when the time comes if you need him. Um, I think the perfect number of bulls for you to have is one more than you've got at the moment. Um, I'm being slightly facetious, but yeah, you know what it's like. Sod's law says that if you have three bulls and you need three bulls, then one of them is going to go wrong. Um, so yeah, however many bulls you've got, get one more and then you'll be about right. Um, why else do people not want to do it? I've heard some feedback saying that the results that we get are not representative of natural mating. Now, the technology that we use for two fertility test bulls has advanced a lot recently. Um, and I've actually been to observe bulls being collected by artificial vagina, so jumping a, a bull and cow and being diverted and collected. So as close to natural service as you can get. And in actual fact, the semen that you collect doing that um, type of collection is almost exactly the same as what we get out from using an electro ejaculator, which is the technique that we use. Um, the only thing that we can't check as vets doing a bull fertility test is mounting ability. Um, so there's still responsibilities to know that your bull can jump and serve cows physically. All we do is collect the sample from him. And we've got a short video clip, like I say, to show you how that process works. There used to be concerns that it was a welfare issue. We are using an electrical stimulus to make the bull give you a sample. Um, like I said, the technology has come on in leaps and bounds. And you'll see in the video clip that it's... It's not disturbing for the bulls. The bull obviously experiences a sensation, but I genuinely don't believe it's an unpleasant or painful sensation. And um, we get some bulls that are more reactive than others, but that's just you know, breed and temperament types. Um, you know that some of your bulls are twitchier than others anyway. So uh, the vast majority of the bulls just handle it absolutely well. Um, and I really don't believe it's a welfare issue at all. Um, it's not difficult to do. That might be an obstacle for some people, but if you can handle your bull and you can get him in a crush, then we can test him. And compared to collecting a bull into an artificial vagina, where you have to have a cow that's bulling and she has to be secured and the bull has to physically jump, you've got to get underneath at that moment and divert the bull into the collection cone. It's, it's really dangerous. Um, whereas having a bull just standing well restrained in a, well, well restrained in a crush is, uh, is a much simpler way of doing things. And, um, and then I guess cost. It costs really a reason not to test a bull. Um, I can only speak for my practice. Uh, the cost of testing one bull um, is almost exactly equivalent to one hour of on-farm time. Um, and if we're testing more bulls, that rate gets lower. 
that's to reflect the time it takes to set up and pack away the equipment at the end. So doing one bull takes a while, doing three bulls does not take three times as long. Um, and what value can you put on it? Bruce has spoken there about the cost of 55 quid per calf conceived from your bull. Um, what's a calf worth if you fertility test a bull, find out that he's not working, have time to give him time to recover or swap in a bull that is functional. If you get one more calf, at the end of calving, then you've more than paid the cost of fertility testing the bull. And given the uh, cost of the bull himself, then fertility testing each bull each year is just a tiny proportion of, uh, of the bull's value. Um, so I hope that has kind of encouraged you to do it. Um, I'm not a webinar presenter, um, and I'm not very good at doing this kind of thing. I'm much better at standing on a farm and telling people and doing things in front of people, but I'm going to attempt to screen share. and. Um, just show you a little clip. This was recorded at the Knocknagale Bull Stud. And it just shows the process of fertility testing a bull. So um, it's a very short clip. I'll pause it and just kind of cover, cover off some of the points of what we do. Obviously, this is the bull coming into the crate. Before any of this, I'm just going to pause there. So before any of this, I would have set up the bull testing equipment. You can just see it in the bottom right. That's the unit that controls the um, probe that goes into the bull. The very first thing we do is we take the bull's detail, write down his ear number, um, take a nickname for him or his actual name. And then we look at him as a kind of physical exam. A bull's got to be able to um, follow cows around uh, across steep hillsides, uh, jump on top of them. So we look at his eyesight. Um, we check in his mouth make sure he can see the cows, to make sure he can eat, feed himself while he's out working. Uh, we look at their feet. I want bulls that I'm passing to be functional, so they've got to have strong legs and good feet, be nice and mobile. And we also look at body condition score, make sure that they are, um, the, uh, the perfect body condition score for a bull is three and a half, so kind of bang in the middle of the, of the condition scale. That leaves them enough cover to work from if they're um, spending too much time working, not eating, um, but it means they're not over fat, so they should be fit enough to do the job. Um, so by this stage, I would have looked at the head end of this bull, worked my way along his side, had a look at his sheath already, um, clipped off any hair that was dangling there, and taken a body condition score for him. And then at this point, I'm obviously examining his testicles. You can see me moving them. I'm looking at the size of them and making sure that they match up. I'm feeling the firmness or otherwise. And the other thing that I do, which we've not shown here, is measure them. Um, so there are three specific pass-fail elements to the bull fertility test. And the first one is scrotal circumference. Um, and for a bull that's two years old, he should have a scrotal circumference of 34 centimeters. And the way I always explain it to my clients, for me, with my hands, I'm just over six foot, my hands aren't huge, but this distance between middle fingers and thumbs, you can check it yourselves, but that's about 34 centimeters. So if you put your hands around a bull's testicles and you can't link your middle fingers and thumbs, then the odds are his testicle is going to be big enough. And if you can put your hands around his testicles and your fingers link really easily or overlap, then they're probably too small. We measure with a very specific measuring tape. But for you guys wanting to see if a bull's got big enough testicles before you buy him, it's a really nice, easy thing to do. You should. I would encourage you all to feel more bulls. I'm rectaling the bull now. We check their internal sex glands. And um, having done that, we put the probe in. So you can just see the probe. I'm pointing at the screen, but you guys can't see what I'm doing. Um, you can see the probe. Can I do this? Maybe you can see my cursor. You see the probe up here. The cable's coming out of it. It's going down to the base unit. So the probe goes up his bump um, and sits with two electrodes over his internal sex glands. And there's a stimulation of those that encourages him to give us a sample. So now um, I'm just fiddling with the machine to make sure that it's going to run for me. The bull's standing kind of semi-interested um, because my hand's been up inside him already. And it just kind of gets them in the mood a little bit. Um, and now I'm just waiting for the stimulus to start. And when the stimulus starts, it comes on in regular and increasing pulses. So you can see the bull reacting. He's drawn his penis out partway. I've got the collection cup over it. Um, the process of collecting takes a couple of minutes. It depends just how quickly the bull reacts. Um, if the bull reacts badly, if he doesn't draw his penis out, if he doesn't give us a sample, we'd give him a couple of minutes to recover and we try him again but I don't test any bulls more than twice. So they get two chances, and then after that, we can rest them. And um, this is me back in the lab now. So I've got the sample in my hand. I'm putting it into a 
heated bath. This isn't always the case for the lab that I set up when I'm working in practice. We don't have quite this fancy facility. This is the bull stud at Inverness. Um, so they've got a water bath there. I use a um, fan heater just to keep everything warm. The flat deck under the microscope, I'll pause there. Flat deck under the microscope is heated as well. We keep everything at body temperature. The semen needs to be body temperature to be mobile. And then the first judgment we make is this one. This is called gross motility. And this is a good example of a bad bull. Um, so there is some movement on the screen here. You can see the flickering there and you can see black bands. I'll just pause that again. What we're looking for is swirls of motion at that point, um, like starlings flocking in the sky. And um, the better the sample, the more dense the sperm, uh, the more dark bands and the more movement we get. This microscope has been a big advantage because my clients can see exactly what I'm seeing and bull testing is a really visual thing. Um, so this is the next part of the past fail. The scrotal circumference is the first part. And then this part is progressive motility. So here we're looking under greater magnification. You can see the sperm as individual sperm cells. They're kind of tadpole shaped, as you can see there. And at this point, we're looking for how many of those sperm are swimming strongly forwards. This is a bad sample. You can see a lot of sperm there that aren't swimming at all. And you can see some in the background, which are just going around in circles. I'll stop sharing there. I'll just show you another slide. Um, of the final part of the test. So after we've collected the semen sample and assuming that everything bull side um, has been okay, um, then the final part of the test is making a slide which we take back to the surgery and look at there. So I'll just scoot through these. These are some wonderfully gory slides showing things that can go wrong with penises, warts on the end of penis, penises and things like that. This is a couple of photographs of the setups so on the left hand side. You can see the probe, it's upside down, and you can see the two electrodes. And the red unit above that is the control unit that does all the um, clever workings. The photograph on the right hand side is of a nicely sophisticated setup with heated stages and everything that you need to keep the sample warm whilst you look at it. And this is an example of the final part of the test. So here we're looking under extremely high power. Um, so this would be a thousand times magnification. Um, and we are looking at the individual sperm cells. And for this, we count 100 cells to see how many of the normal. This is a really bad sample. You perhaps don't need to be an expert to see that what we've got here is a lot of heads which don't have any tails associated with them. This sample shows a defect called the distal midpiece reflex. And here you can see that each tail is bent back on itself and it has a little blob in it. So that's abnormal sperm cells. These ones, they don't have the stain in the background, but you can see little blobs just where the head meets the tail, and that's called the cytoplasmic droplet. Um, so they would be failing up abnormal morphology as well. And then this last one just shows some kind of random scuzzy cells that can get in there. Okay, so I'm aware that that was a pretty quick run through. Um, I work to BCVA standards, that's British Cattle Vet Association standards. So at the end of doing this process for my clients, you would get a written report which covers all the details of those three specific pass-fail elements, but also any other things that have cropped up along the way as well. Robert, I think that's probably me. Excellent. No, thank you very much, Mark. There are questions to follow on that, but I think what we'll do is we'll just get Karen just now, just very quickly, on on the role of nutrition in this story, and then we'll come back for some some questions later. But please do keep it, keep your questions coming, because eh, they're it's your webinar, not me. So, Karen, over to you. Hi there, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, thanks very much, Bruce and Mark, two excellent presentations. Um, I'll just be a quick five um, minutes um, on nutrition before we can get some questions. Um, so we've heard obviously about Bruce's system and um, and Mark about the vet side of it as well. And um, it was brilliant that Mark obviously brought up the nutrition of bulls um, Bulls are something that is forgotten about probably um, by folk in the winter. Um, if I had a pound for every time I had an excuse on a farm of why the bulls are not out <laughs> out with the cows, you know, they're and why they're not in a good setup themselves, honestly. So I think looking after bulls is really really important. Um, uh, in the winter time, they need um good condition um coming up to mating time, so they need well fed in the winter as well, and they need the same mineral and vitamin requirements as cows as well so please don't forget about the the bulls um obviously to um uh, a tight calving we are looking for good nutrition 
thin cows um, are going to take longer to get back in calf and that actually starts before the cow has had the calf. Um, if she is thin before she has had her calf she is more likely to um, take longer to get back in calf afterwards as well so something to think about if you um, are continually having some cows that are lean pre-calving is to look at your nutritional management throughout the winter months. Um, another risk factor is obviously twins. They need, um, before calving, about 25 megajoules more energy than a single calf. So um, mothers of twins are obviously going to be leaner and uh, after calving as well, they um, have a higher demand on them for milk because they're obviously trying to feed two calves. So looking after them nutritionally as well. Um, so thinking about condition of the cows pre-calving um, and what impact that may have. So if you've had an issue with that, um, think about you know, next year, what you can do to try and prevent that. Um, if you have thin cows and the twins after calving, just um, if you can separate them and treat them um, uh, much kinder and uh, give them some supplementation. And we speak to a nutritionist about what they require, but also thinking about turning um, cows and calves out as well. Um, quite often I see cows and calves popped out to fields if the weather is good, but maybe the grass is not quite there. So, um, if your grass is below six centimetres, for example, and, and the weather is not growthy weather, um, they are likely to need supplemented. A cow with a calf at foot needs about 60 kilos of grass, I say 20% dry matter a day, um, to to um, uh, get her own maintenance needs and that of milk and keep condition on herself. So if the grass supply is not there, please don't be frightened to supplement your cattle, whether that's um, with silage or whether it's with concentrates, if the grass isn't there. Um, and um, you know this might not be a problem in areas where it's good grass growth or on your, or your on rotational grazing systems but um, in areas where it's poorer grass growth or later um, areas um, I will just pop up a slide at the moment I think um, is that okay Robert can you see that yes can see it okay yeah yep. so just some uh, top tips for um uh, nutrition for fertility. Think about cow condition all year round. We're not wanting massive swings in cow condition. Um, by all means, you can use good cow condition in the summertime over the winter time to save costs, but don't take it to the extreme um, as it will affect calf survival. Um, make sure the base ration that you have is as good as it can be. So making sure forage quality um you know what the for you know you know if you if you've got poor forage as long as you know you've got poor forage and you can supplement especially if people are calving at the moment um before grass um is growing and if cows that have calved are not put out of the pen with the calving cows, there's going to be compromise somewhere because the diet is not going to be good enough for the cows with calves at foot. So really consider um, moving those cows with calves at foot if you're calving shortly and can't put cows out to grass, um, that you are giving them what they require. Uh, for minerals, I think just knowing the facts of what your farm is likely to be deficient in as well, uh, don't assume what you might be deficient of. There's all sorts of, sort of um, stories go around that you, you know your neighbour might say, "Oh, we're always short of selenium." But don't think of minerals in isolation. That you know the actual elements in isolation. Think of it of the whole picture. And um, yeah, if you're there, are some farms who are organic or not feeding minerals, maybe in more outdoor systems. I think. I would encourage you to, to, to think carefully about that as well because all grasses are short of trace elements and um, depending on the type of cows you have in your system, you might be okay for a few years, but I think that you need to check this on a regular basis. So checking by maybe doing bloods once a year um, just to cover yourself um, because when you do get a deficiency, um, it, it'll be too late and problems will have occurred. So just really encouraging you to look at the whole picture and um, rather than a quick fix, so not thinking about copper or, or selenium and things in isolation and think on your farm where nutritional management um, improvements can be made. And my final thought would be that um, I was at a farm meeting last week and I think the importance of having a good team around you. So the relationship with the you know, the farmer, the stock person, the vet, nutritionist and, you know, your feed supplier. I think it's all good to have everyone talking and have a good relationship. And that's where the magic really happens when everyone works well together. Um, I think also it's important to, you know, for, for you to have your peers and other farmers, you know, having a good group of, of people around you as well. And it's always 
um, fantastic to get people to look at your animals and see where uh, they think you're at. And, you know, if you've got some good pals that you can just say, look, come on, wh where do you think my cattle are at? What improvements that can be, be made? I think that's uh, really where a lot of... Um, uh, magic can happen. So that was my final thoughts. As a quick run through, Robert, um, it was just I'm aware of time <laughs> there. So is there anything I've missed out that you want me to, no, to cover? I think nothing that we can't pull out in some questions anyway. So that's okay. ideal if I can ask. The, thank you, Karen. That was ideal. No you can, you're, um, Karen, I should say, is the seasoned professional when it comes to webinars. You did COVID well, I don't know. I'll rush through that a bit quick there. <laughs> no, it's ideal. Um, so question... To Bruce and to Mark, actually, about handling systems, it's a really important question, and one that our you touched on it to start with, Bruce. Our health and safety record is pretty poor as an industry, really poor as an industry, and needs to improve. So, there's the health and safety aspect of handling systems, but also the cow stress, and I suppose the people stress aspect of the triple synchro AI program. There's a lot of handlings involved in that. How important is the good so Easter Howgate has a couple of good handling systems. Yeah. How important is that handling system to you and also to your herd? Uh, to us, it's probably just as important as anything, to be honest. Uh, like our main handling system at Howgate itself has always been really quite good, it got put in with a brand new shed. But three, three years ago, uh, four years ago, three years ago. We had a handling system along at one of our other yards where we were handling a lot of cattle for the AI processing. If we're being frank and honest with ourselves, it wasn't safe. Uh, vets were complaining, our AI technician was complaining, the stress on the cows was unbelievable. We were pushing them into small areas, it was mobile setups, it just wasn't good. And when we looked at it, they continually had the poorest conception rates, like sometimes they were really poor compared to the rest of the herd. And it was getting to the point where we're probably going to have to stop AI along that part of the farm. Uh, but instead, what we did is we actually invested a lot of money and we built a new handling system ourselves. Uh, and since we've built that handling system, we've got a fully installed crush. Everything's solid. It's all concrete, metal posts, metal gate gates. Uh, the conception rates are now just as good along that side of the farm as they are anywhere else in the farm. And I'm talking sometimes it could have been anywhere between 15% poorer. So that's a massive increase for us. But the health and safety point of view, from a vet's point of view, it's a lot safer. They're not at any risk of any gates falling on them, beasts getting out of crashes, anything like that. Everything's secure. Animals are now... They're, all, they're a lot quieter as well when you handle them. They used to be real noisy. They were pushing. They were just trying to get out there as quick as they can. Whereas now in the new handling system we bought... They just run through it nice and smoothly. They're quiet. They're calm. The conception is are better. We are happier. It goes faster. Uh, so, yeah, handling systems for the AI, in general, but especially for the AI, is uh, really important, I would say. It's hard to think about, you know, 50 cows in a lot split off from their calves, all bullying at the same time. Yeah. You know, it's little wonder we need a handling system and, and stress is so, so important. And I think the message from, from me is, all of these interventions, you know, including bull testing, let's only do them if we can do them safely. You know, there's a there's things that we used to do behind gates and stuff and make do and measure. If we can't do it safely, let's not, you know, let's change the system or, or, or invest some money in, in something that's going to keep you safe. Um, Mark, for you, the the role of stress and fertility, you know, what is it is it worth discussing? You know, is that somewhere we want to go just now? I know I appreciate it's a wee bit off piece from what we were asked to speak about. I think. Uh... No, that's that's fine. Yeah, um, I didn't cover on the reasons that bulls can become infertile, if that's what you're wondering about, and it's it's a huge topic. I think a lot of the time, kind of speculating about why it's happened is probably a, it's certainly a lot less important than identifying that it's happened. Um, but what's ridiculous is that bulls weigh in a ton to 1,200 kilos are remarkably delicate when it comes to fertility. And so all it takes is a sore foot for a couple of days or a raised temperature for a few days as a result of you know, anything, a sudden drop in body condition or a sudden check in nutrition or, or you know, a significant parasite burden. Any of those things that can affect any bovine um, will just stop a bull's fertility in its tracks. The reason that the testicles hang low is because they need to be below body temperature to make sperm. And so if a bull gets hot, then sperm production is just knocked out. And the sperm production cycle is eight weeks long. And so if you have two days of damage, 
everything that was being made is taken out and it takes eight weeks for the process to come back to where it was again. So, so yeah, a very short period of insult or stress to a bull can lead to a fairly prolonged period of infertility or subfertility. Yeah, and I, I, I'll go back to you and then to Karen on this one, but the old story, the Sterling bull sales are just passed and the overfeeding of bulls is certainly still... I think it's a thing that we are we are driving as an industry as you know people buying bulls we're always buying the fit ones um the what do you see in terms of that you know the the ro- the overfed bull the bull that's been pushed too hard do you see a lot of young bulls that actually go subfertile or have fertility issues close to you know before or just after sale yeah that's a really good question um I don't I don't have numbers on how that affects them roundabout sale because I suppose they're either coming and they've been pre-tested or um, we're testing them shortly after sale and just taking what we find at the time, working out whether the stress of sale itself has contributed to be hard. But um, if you buy a bull out of Sterling, and like you say, we are all complicit. The people selling at Sterling need their bulls to be in very good condition or else they take them home again. And the buyers might complain about bulls being overfed and being pushed too hard, and yet they keep buying those bulls. And so, so it's a kind of circular problem at the moment. Um, but yeah, if you buy a bull out of Sterling, he's not fit to work immediately. Uh, like um, you know, we're in the northeast of Scotland. The land here is fairly gentle compared to some areas. If you're on the west coast or further over in the highlands, you're expecting a bull to go charging across a hillside chasing cows. A bull's been kept in extremely good conditions in a concrete pen being very well fed. He's not been out in a natural environment at all. And he will be over-conditioned. Like most bulls coming out of Sterling are somewhere around about body condition score four and a half. So they've got a lot of weight to lose before they even get down to a level of fitness that means they're able to go and work. And then longer term, yeah, higher rates of grain feeding lead to problems in feet. Whether they're visibly struggling with laminitis or not, then um, they've probably laid down areas of weakness that are going to cause problems in the future. Um, you can tell, Robert, I could go on about this for a long time. Yeah, but yeah our, bulls, our bulls should be fitter, like and truly, I'm... like athletically fitter. A fit or not fatter. Yeah. Um, and I think we should point out for two reasons other bull sales are available. <laughs> so you can get overfed bulls at other sales. Absolutely, uh, and also yeah. the, we can buy bulls at somewhere else in Sterling. Um, Karen, what's the thoughts at your end from a, you know management of that bull coming back? There'll be a lot of new bulls have hit farms this week. What do we do about that that boy? You know, How do we wean him off or how do we get him f- fit or as fit as we can to work by June, July time? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, you're spot on about the, the bulls. I think the the message for me would be to try and avoid buying bulls like that. And, uh, you know, if, if you have bought one that has been overfed, um, sort of taper them down, but still keep them on good quality silage and a, a few kilos of um, a good beef feed or, a you know, some barley and protein, um, you know, don't nose dive them straight off onto a change of ration. But I think um, it's a good point about bulls going, you know, if your bulls have been in wintered, and they're expected to work with cows at grass, you know, don't just put them from straight inside to, you know, onto grass because that change in diet, they'll take a couple of weeks to adapt on that and that could affect their their working ability as well. So if possible, have those bulls out and exercising, you know, get the limbs moving um, and and get them adjusted to their grass diet um, before they go out, if possible. It's not always possible understand um but i think uh, i i do see quite a few bulls who you know young bulls that are getting brought out for sales um are on on too much concentrates and even when you've got you know some hay or silage topped in with a ration the percentage um as part of the dry matter can still be quite low on on what the the forage part of it is um, and they're effectively still being fed like bull beef animals and the longevity of those animals is obviously going to suffer so I think it's a good question to ask the people that you're buying the bull from and um, I think my ideal would be that that bull for its lifetime is um, being fed 50% of its dry matter from forage which um, is is a, a hard ask um, but it would have to be some pretty good forage but I think uh, that's where I think that's where the industry should, should be aiming for for longevity of bulls from a feed point of view. Yeah, because there is nothing worse than that bull. You know, he's fine. He does a job for two years, and then his feet, you know, his feet are a disaster. Or he's, mm-hmm. a, you know, structurally he's all fine, other than what we've done to him. Anyway, we could have a whole separate it's a big stress on, on them. Um, the the change in diet is a big stress on them as well. So yeah, Bruce, there's a wee bit interest or a bit of interest in terms of a sex semen. So sex semen into the beef, obviously hugely important in the dairy sector, and and also indirectly the beef sector through the dairy. Um, but 
beef wise it's it's not it's not you know it's, you, you've not got a monopoly on it but there's not that much of it happening in the beef world are you finding you so conception rates one one question is about our conception rates a bit lower and the other question is do you in your if you put 70 cows to sexed male semen how many females are you getting in that group are you you know what's the how reliable is it uh, I'll be able to answer this because our autumn herd, I didn't really speak about it much for the last four years now, our autumn herd has been fully AI'd to male sex semen. Uh, and when we decided to do this, we were told that we're roughly a 10% poorer conception rate using the male sex semen to conventional semen. So to counteract that, what we did is we added into our program an additional dose of ASCON, which is the same as your receptals. And we give them that at the point of their first AI. So when the semen's going in them for the first time on the first day, they get an extra hit of this ace gone. And we actually found that giving them this boosted their conception rates by 10%. So because we started giving them this drug at the same time, we actually found there was no drop in our conception rates uh, from moving to the male sex semen. The results from our autumn um, herd have shown that they've consistently stayed the same as what they always were with the conventional semen. And doing our Angus heifers last year with the female sex semen, uh, the limousine female sex semen and the Angus heifers, we hit them and we give them the ace gone at the same time on the first day and they held the same as what the lings and our limousines did and they were two conventional sex semen. Uh, conventional semen, sorry. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, you asked that. Yes, a uh, female one. In terms of our autumn herd, we have had two female calves in three cabins now uh, of this of to this male sex semen. Uh, so you're talking, this is anywhere between 50 and 70 cows. So say 60 is a good figure. It's 180 cows. You, we've only had two. So on average, it's a very good reliability that it's a male. It's going to be a male calf when we've hit it with male sex semen. And then we're hoping we've got 27, 28 Angus heifers calving with limbs and female sex semen this spring, and we're hoping if at the very worst we'll have one maybe bull calving that, as uh, so we're expecting them all to be female. So purely on our what we've experienced with thought and heard. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, um, Mark. Just a final question to you: is you've obviously covered the veterinary aspect of the bull. See, in terms of PD time for cows. So if we know it's not the bull. What are the common pitfalls for fertility in cows, and what's you know, what's the thing that probably the thing that frustrates you? What's the one that we routinely get wrong that's an easy fix? Yeah, that's um, that's a brilliant question, and if I knew the answer, um, my <laughs> clients would be a lot more satisfied than they are. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it makes me think of the was it the Sky Cycling team, and they started talking about marginal gains, and they were saying that we don't need to be five percent faster; we just need to be half percent faster in lots of different ways. And I really feel that once you get up to ninety percent in calf, um, then after that, it's probably not one thing that's leaving you falling short. So if you have a terrible PD session, you're at seventy five percent in calf, and something's gone badly wrong. And it's quite easy to look at which groups fell short, and if one group fell short, you go and point the finger at that bull. If if the average is poor across all the groups, then it's much more likely to be a cow issue. Um, the real challenge of finding out what's caused the problem is we're looking at it after the event. And so, yeah, Karen will have much better ideas about this than I do, but trying to find nutritional issues in cows at, at PDing and um, trying to reflect what was happening at bulling time, I find really challenging, especially for cows that are on grass-based systems. Um, everyone gets excited about trace elements. It's a seeming easy fix you can buy a bucket of something different or a bolus of something different and it will make all your problems go away and i'm skeptical enough to think that that's probably not always the case um but yeah look at your cow's health look at your cow's nutrition look at your cow's trace element status and make sure that you've kind of ticked all of those boxes i think i think having confidence in what diseases you've got on your farm and knowing that you've done something about it whether it's eradication or whether it's vaccination or whether it's a worm and fluke program making sure that all those kind of cow health boxes are ticked um, and then nutrition. And I think a lot of the time, our guys are pretty good at vaccinating what they need to vaccinate against. You know, they're pretty good at worming and fluking. I think, I, think, I suspect, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, Karen, I, I suspect a lot of the time it comes down to some small shortfall in nutrition around about the time the cows are being bull. Yeah, condition of cows, nutrition, yeah, it's definitely um, the whole picture. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and we see it when you get the lean, you know, lean cows at calving lead to a bad calving, lead to a bad bulling, which leads into, you know, it just it kind of snowballs. Sheep are a lot easier because we've got a, it's an annual cycle, but it all happens within that year. Whereas the cow, it's a much, you know, it's a, a longer turnover. So, uh, so it's tricky. I would say, Robert, sorry, yeah. sorry, just to make sure it's been covered. I hope hopefully everyone's aware of this, but your second cow calvers, the ones that are going to get in calf for the second time. Are definitely your kind of highest risk group for failing to get in calf. Um, so yeah, I think people look after their heifers relatively well, and I think once cows get to their third calving, they're robust enough to look after themselves. But those ones that have just calved for the first time as heifers, and you're trying to get them back in calf, if you're going to treat anything carefully, especially it's that group that you need to target. Yeah, I think we um, from our meeting last week, the, one of the conclusions was we do hear the deaf totally agree that they are the highest priority group. But we do probably hear from people calving at three that, you know, the the failure to get second calvers back and calf is the, you know, that's the biggest drawback because there's a lot of really good stories. Most people get on really pretty well calving at two and they're being good to those, that group, but they're probably just observing them a bit more and giving them the best of their grass. They're not pumping them full of feeding or, you know, if you hear the, the anti-calving at two, a discussion, you know, you you would think we were a uh, putting the cow in a bull beef system, but you know, it's it's just a simple thing. And I really I like your point, Mark. The the Team Sky thing, you know, try to be five percent better or be half a percent better ten times. You know, that's a take home message. As teeny marginal gains do all add up. Um, Karen, one thing from our uh, Giles Henry meeting last week was about calving date. So what you mentioned about turning cows out to grass when there's no grass yet and calving mm -hmm. early and I'm conscious people will be calving here just now with a view to selling a big suckle calf later in the year what about the other side of that what about the moving calving date to get closer to grass yeah so I just putting the bull in a bit later and uh, yeah. and and yeah maybe calving when the nutrition from the grass is there rather than having to feed too much inside as well. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for that to make life a bit easier for people as well. Um, yeah. Is yeah. That, yeah. And I think yeah, it comes to what we're trying to achieve. You know, the the easy life, yeah. if it's not working, if it's if you're calving fine through the through early early spring, doing well, selling suckle calves and it's going well, good. But if it's not if it's not working, one of the easiest, the lowest of low hanging fruit is to shift the bull back a bit get closer to grass things are cleaner things are better yeah. and yeah. A, a bit more natural the only thing is obviously if we have a calving interval change toward in terms of beef calf sub and things that could be an un unintended consequence so i think it's really important at the moment it's good to talk you know do do ask questions before you make changes and just make sure it's not going to have any any big a uh, unknown unforeseen um consequence with that, I think it's also important we point out that we've not mentioned a PSF funding at all today. So preparing for sustainable farming is a thing. It's a there's a there's pots of money there, actually fairly generous pots of money, including for a bull fertility testing. Um, we certainly have raised the point that the a female fertility side would also be useful to have in there as well. So uh, hopefully, potentially we'll see that coming. But certainly for anybody who's interested, there's a lot of useful parts to the PSF programme, which uh, puts a bit of money in your pocket as a reward for doing, either if you're doing it already, you know, it's a reward for doing it, and it's an encouragement if you've, if you've not done it already. So certainly that bull testing story, I'm sure Mark will be really glad to hear that he's 150 bulls he's normally testing might be near 300 or whatever next year. So uh, all good. So yes, finished on, that's the end of our uh, Sustainable Beef System series. Hopefully we'll have another series for next year uh, we're planning to have a um, farm event and things as well for it um, but really I just want to take this opportunity to thank our speakers tonight uh, so to Karen, Mark and to Bruce, it's been really useful, good conversation we obviously haven't covered everything, we could be here uh, for a month and still not cover everything but I think we've got a good insight into what happens at Easter Howgate a good practical understanding, of, uh, you know, what does the farmer need to know about bull fertility testing? And Karen, as planned, filled in all the gaps, the nutrition wise, uh, and uh, covered what we need to know, I think. So uh, we've gone quite a bit over time, which is a 
either a good sign or a bad sign, but hopefully a good sign. Uh, covered a lot of ground. Um, we will get a feedback form. Feedback's really important. Um, negative feedback is also appreciated if you're not happy with something or want to change something, that is something I want to hear uh, so please do take a bit of time to do that and there's a heap of stuff on sustainable beef, beef systems and fertility on the Farm Advisory Service website and Baz Sounds podcasts and all sorts of things so uh, do have a look at that if you want more information or feel free I'm sure any of the speakers tonight or indeed in any of the rest of the a webinars we've had will be ha more than happy to hear from you so uh, do get in touch if you've got any issue um so yes that is us thank you very much thank you yes. all the best everybody bye thanks bye, -bye. bye.